But Pope Francis is saying, uh, we've got to change this, that we have to become evangelists. So what is it for us, as we don't have this background of understanding, what is it that Francis is calling us to do? What is evangelization? Well, evangelization is based on the word evangelium in Greek, which means good news. Good news. And Obedite talked about evangelization as being a witness of love a witness of the way we live. Pope Francis says, we Catholics don't proselytize. We don't go out trying to convert. We look for that. We look to draw people to what we have because we find that what we have is really good. It transforms our lives. It gives them purpose and meaning that nothing else does. So, we don't proselytize, we attract. And this attracting is done by, by our showing the good news as it has affected our lives. That's why Francis says Catholics should not look for always like they're just coming from a few. Okay. He says Catholics should not look like Lent without a possibility of Easter. <laughs> they have the we must show our joy and our and this good news that we have. And when we do social justice, that's the context that that needs to happen. This has to be good news for people around us and for our society and for our country. Now he says we've got to do this with enthusiasm and vitality. I think these are two virtues, if you want, or characteristics that our church is very short of. Um, because of things that have happened over the past 20, 30 years, I think we have much discouragement in the church. You know, uh, everybody's got people in their families who stop going to mass. We've got children who don't attend mass anymore. We've got grandchildren who we don't have grandchildren, you have grandchildren, who aren't being baptized. And our churches are declining in membership. If it weren't for the Filipinos and the East Indians and the Africans that have come here, our churches would be largely empty. So this bothers us and it discourages us and it saps our energy. And we become people in Lent and not seeing these. We've been through a really rough period over the sexual abuse occurrences. Um, this has uh, completely changed the way we have seen the church. We're talking about this in the priest's gathering last week. I was affected. Our image of ourselves in the world has been devastating for us. Uh, and I don't mean in the sense of saying poor us, but it's terrible that this has happened and the results of what these terrible things that have happened have really affected our understanding ourselves. And then we have secularism, which has blossomed in the last 10, 20 years. And it succeeded in some degree in making us believe that we, we are not relevant. No, we're just some sort of little private group that we should stay private. And religion is a personal, private thing that you practice in your own house or in your own small community. <coughs> So it says that religion is not relevant, and it says so often that we have the tendency to believe that. So we feel that we've been pushed to some degree out on the margins, on the peripherals, that we're not relevant. And that's very difficult to take for us, because we know deep down that what we have to say and what we do is extremely relevant. And because of that awareness, despite of all of these negative things, there remains in our community a strong undercurrent of strength and of faith. And what I find now is I travel around the diocese and meet people and talk to them, that there is a resurgence of this positive energy. It's beginning, people have, that are dealing with all of these negative and now we are feeling the sense that we really do have something that is of great value, not only for us, but for the 
in this initiative of what he calls a new phase of evangelization, Pope Francis is really providing us with a tool, a way of living our faith that is going to strengthen the church and renew its vigor. It's going to give us, it will give us a purpose again, a purpose again. So what Francis says in, in his exhortation is that if, if we're going to carry out this new undertaking, this new way of evangelizing, this new way of living, he hopes that we will undertake what he calls a pastoral and missionary conversion. A pastoral and missionary conversion. He says, I hope that all communion, all communities will devote the necessary effort to advancing along the path of a pastoral and missionary conversion, which cannot leave things as they presently are. And he's right. The situation that we have sort of morphed into is something that we do not like. We do not like a weakened church. We do not like uh, a church which is not strong and holy and influential. So he says, things cannot stay as they are in the church. So if they cannot stay the way they are, that means we must move them to something else. Because a conversion is always a turning away from something to something else. So he says, mere administration can no longer be enough in our parishes and in our church. We're not just here to hang on it says, throughout the world, let us be permanently in a state of mission. That's, I was going to say revolutionary, I can't say revolutionary, that's not what we are. This is a tremendous shift that is going to happen in the church. What do we mean then by conversion? What do we mean by this shift? It's a moving from one way of living to another way of living. We often use the word that people have undergone a religious conversion, which means they've turned from being their life going in one direction to their life going in another direction. I think he's called this is for us an opportunity to move from encouragement to enthusiasm, to move from from a sense of lethargy to some, a sense of vitality. Now, if we're going to do that, we need to regain the conviction that we do have something, not only that is good, but it, that is worthwhile letting other people know about. We have a better alternative to what our secular society is offering us as a way to live our lives. We're beginning to see within our secular society today all sorts of cracks developing, which are uh, manifesting that this way of living is not healthy or good or productive for people. We have something better, and we'll talk about that later uh, when we get into Francis sort of points out as the specific things that are happening in our society. And the fact that we've got something better for people is good news. And that good news is what we try to then promote and to uh, get out to people. And we need to be aware of the good news that we have because we are followers of Jesus Christ. To be an evangelist is to proclaim the good news that comes to people because of Jesus Christ. And that's our goal as Catholic Christian people. And so Francis says, we have to now see ourselves that we are permanently in a state of mission. He's saying Catholics are missionaries. Not just the missionaries. Not just the Scarborough or Columbus or a missionary. We understand by being a missionary. Every Catholic 
is a missionary and must see all that we do as missionary work. In, the, in his, his letter, he says, what he's written is simply a way of showing, of showing how important these practical implications are for the church's mission. All of them will help give a shape to a definite style of evangelization, which I ask you to adopt in every activity that you undertake. And that's not me, that's the folks. These, these words are directed to every person in the Catholic Church. When he calls us to undergo a missionary conversion, we have to ask ourselves, what does that mean? We have an old view of missionary, right? Uh, this is a wonderful picture I saw in the Scarborough Foreign Mission Office once when I was there. It was taken probably in the 1940s. And there was about a dozen young priests on this ship, and four or five nuns in full habit, all of them smiling, getting ready to set out for China, probably, or the Far East, or Africa. I think the Scarborough did. That was our view of missionary, going to foreign countries to bring the good news, the gospel, and the faith, the Roman Catholic faith, to people without faith. But I don't think that we saw ourselves as missionaries. They were the missionaries. So then if, if Francis is calling us to change, to convert from understanding, not understanding ourselves as missionaries, seeing our, each of us as being a missionary. How are we going to do that? In what ways do our parishes understand that they are missionary parishes? Obviously not, not, not clearly. It's not that we've never been aware of the need to draw people to the church. But we used to do it by saying, we will reveal the truth that we possess and people therefore will come and see the truth. They would come and become Catholics. Now Francis says, no, while the goal, the goal is to draw people to Christ, we don't go out to convert them, proselytizing, we don't try to convert them. What we do is we try to attract them. He says that we need to move towards a true sense of joy in what we have because of our faith and see that everything we do is an opportunity to make that joy evident to other people. Catholics are not used to, we Catholics are not used to doing that. We're very private in our faith. Very private. I suspect that most Catholics don't go out in the business place and talk about their Catholic faith. Uh, if we have evangelical friends that we work at, they're much better at that. We don't leave scripture, cards of scripture verses around the desks in the offices of all those people we work with. Okay? We don't go around asking people, are you saved? Uh, I work with this in dialogue with evangelicals, so all of this is. Uh, an interesting part of our relationship. We can learn from them. Okay? We can learn from them. Not that we want to do that, because often that is proselytizing. What we do is we show people how good it is to be a Catholic. Okay? How good it is in our lives. And there are those of the opportunities in our society today that will give us a chance to so this is evangelizing, and it's done in many ways. In our context this morning, we'll see that we evangelize when we confront the injustices of our society in our and our world. We evangelize when in that confrontation we proclaim the good news of the dignity and the respect for everyone that is found in the kingdom of God proclaimed by Jesus Christ. Our missionary activity of 
proclaiming the good news of God's justice for everyone is directed towards everyone without exclusion. So Francis is saying to us, you know, this is not just another thing to do. Okay? We've we got to set up a committee for this, we got to get it done. This is a way that we live. And this is a way that a Catholic sees herself or himself. And this is the way that a Catholic parish must see itself. Every activity, Pope oh Francis is saying, every activity that a Catholic community undertakes is now understood or is asking us to understand it as a missionary. And this includes social justice, which is carried out within the Christian community, and which sees itself as proclaiming the good news of just treatment for every person. Parish is not an outdated institution, 
precisely because it possesses great flexibility. It can assume quite different contours depending on the openness and missionary creativity of the pastor and of the community. Openness and creativity. And that might be your challenge in your marriage. Because it's not everything does not depend only on the pastor. The pastor is an extremely important person in your parish. And he wants your parish to be strong and healthy. But he needs you to work with him to achieve that. And for those of us who see the interest and import, the importance of social justice in the way we live our faith, then that becomes an energy that can help change the parish from the way it is becoming a missionary parish. A group of people who understand when they say, oh, I am a missionary. I am a missionary. That's what it means to be a Catholic. And the parish says, we are a missionary parish. And that will give the parish a focus and an energy that will be very helpful to them. He goes on to say, well, Francis, well, certainly it's not the only institution which evangelizes. Parents, it's not the only institution which evangelizes. If the parish proves capable of self-renewal and constant adaptivity, then it continues to be the church living in the midst of the homes of her sons and daughters. And this presumes that it really is in contact with the homes and lives of its people, and it does not become a useless structure out of touch with people or a self-absorbed group made up of the chosen few. Now that's the temptation for all our parishes to become. It can become closed in on itself. They're just to keep things the way they are, or hang on to them unless they disappear. And sometimes made up of the chosen few who sort of control many things in the And Francis says, that's not good. That's not good. We need to have this creativity of the community and this uh, openness to change. We call to become, not to stay where we are, but to move on to something that's important and wonderful for the community. And he goes on to this. He says, the parish is the presence of the church in a given territory. It's an environment for hearing God's word. An environment for hearing God's word. For growth in the Christian life. For dialogue. For proclamation. For charitable outreach. For worship and celebration. Now, I think every pastoral council is to look at that number 27 to see how well each of our parishes in fact are like that. Where God's word is constantly proclaimed, where there's growth in the Christian life, there's dialogue in the parish, there's proclamation of the good things that we have, there's charitable outreach, we are touching the lives of people and the way we worship itself. So that's our discernment. We look into these, look into ourselves in my friends and sisters. And then purification, which is part of the process then of conversion. He says that the parish, in all its activities, in all its activities, the parish encourages and encourages and trains its members to be evangelists. I'm not sure how many parishes have even begun that. Yet it's there and it's one of the goals that Francis puts forward to us. It's the parish where people are encouraged to be evangelized. It's in the parish that people are trained to be evangelized. So I think our parish communities need to say, okay, how are we going to do this? What do we need to do to, to become evangelized? 
what do we need to do to help us understand that we are missionaries to our world today, not to China and Africa, but to Muscat and Regina and Weber and, and Jonathan and all these, every, every little place where there's a Catholic community. Pastoral ministry in a missionary style, he's, uh, Francis says, is not obsessed with the disjointed transmission of a multitude of doctrines to be insistently imposed. Those are big words and very common, but listen to what it said. If we're going to be missionaries, that we're not obsessed with a multitude of doctrines that are insistently imposed that everybody has to live up to it. When we adopt the pastoral goal and a missionary style, which would actually reach out, reach everyone without exception or exclusion, and that's who would be the object of our missionary programs. Everyone, without exception, without exclusion, there is nobody that cannot be drawn into participation in the life of the church. Nobody. Nobody. He says, we're going to do that. Something that's going to reach out to everyone. Then he says, the message has to concentrate on the essentials, on what is most beautiful in our faith, what is most grand, he said, what is most appealing in our faith. And each of us can do that. Because in our, if we wouldn't be here this morning if we had not experienced in our lives the beauty of our faith and the grandness of our faith in our life and how appealing our faith is to us and how necessary it is in our lives to be happy. He says the church, he uses the word go forth. The church, he says we have to go forth. Get out of our, he, he uses that in his you stay inside the closed room, you get sick, because the air gets bad. Okay. He says you have to, he doesn't want a sick church, he said, I want a church that's all dirty and messy because it's out on the streets. So he says it has to go forth, but the Italian word that he used there is avanti. In other words, get going. Let's get going. Avanti. Where we go? Where we go? Go for it, and then you sound so stiff. You say it again, go for it, the mass is ended. You say, get out there, the mass is ended. The mass is ended, go, get, get out there, come on, come on. A church which goes forth, who says to itself, come on, get out there, is a church whose doors are open. Going out to others in order to reach the fringes of humanity, he says, doesn't mean rushing out aimlessly into the world. He says, it's better, obviously, to slow down, set aside our eagerness in order to see and listen to others. To stop rushing from one thing to another and to remain with someone who has altered the law. talks about different ways of why the church is involved in it. Where it needs to take people where they are. And then be with them. Be with them. He says, at times we have to be like the father of the prodigal son who always keeps his door open so that when the son returns, it's, it's easy for him to live. We need to let our churches, our parishes be the doors of our Parish and our parish are to be easy for people to get. And that's why he says sometimes, you know, we act as arbiters of grace rather than facilitators. We act as arbitrators of grace, judging who is entitled to win and who isn't, rather than being facilitators of God's love and grace, making it easy for people to be touched by that. He says, the church is not a toll house. It is the house of the Father where there is a place for everyone with all their problems. And that becomes the matter of reform. That's, we need to find a way to do that. To see
seek this vision of formation, universality, and openness to everyone. So any effort of social justice that has to be rooted in this vision of the parish community. A parish community that is open, that is welcoming. A parish community that sees itself as possessing treasures of good news, that it wants to share with everybody and make it as easy as possible for everyone to, to share in those joys. It's in the parish community that we experience the body of Christ energy and the spiritual health that we need if we are going to bring the good news of the social teaching of the church to all people without exclusion or exception. How am I doing? Ten more minutes? Good evening. Final session. Some particular social justice
that's in the sun. But the very fact that fear and anxiety becomes almost epidemic in our culture is an indication that something is wrong. The joy of living is fading for many people. The lack of respect for others and violence are on the rise. And inequality is increasingly evident. For many people, it's a struggle to live and often to live with precious little dignity. And we know that. We know that. Well, Francis says, okay, be aware of that. We need to do something about that. That's not good news. Therefore, the things in our contemporary society that we will confront, and when we confront them, we are, in fact, evangelized. When we confront these things, we are evangelized. When we confront them, we are acting as missionary disciples. Now, he says there's four thou shalt not. He says, the Bible says thou shalt not kill. He says, okay, I've got a few other things. He says, thou shalt not kill. He says, one of the thou shalt not is to accept this, what he calls, the economy of exclusion in our world. He says, this is number 53, can we continue to stand by when food is thrown away while people are starving? You know, we, we do that. How much, how much food in Canada is thrown away when people in the world are starving? We can't do that. He said, this is a case of what we call inequality. He says, today everything comes under the laws of competition and the survival of the pit, where the powerful feed upon the powerless. As a consequence, masses of people find themselves excluded and marginalized, without work, without possibilities, without means of escape. Spain and Italy, I don't know if it's any better now, but Spain and Italy have great problems because their unemployment among those 25 and 30 and under is something like 40% or 60%. I'm not going to statistics. this. When a whole country has no hope for the future in its youth, then we have something that is destructive. Another thing, and this is, this is very applicable to us, human beings are themselves considered consumer goods to be used and discarded. People are consumer goods to be used and discarded. The greatest stupidity, I think, that in today's world, and the question of trafficking of women and prostitution is called the sex trade, like the coffee trade. Or the cocoa <laughs> trade. Okay. And we accept that. You know, so every, how the CBC or any news could talk about the sex trade without realizing how demeaning that is, is just uh, boggles my mind. It, it's, it's just in, indicative of how easily we slip into what is disgustingly unacceptable. The question of Aboriginal women who are being or missing today, how difficult it is to get our society to deal with that. Remember when I was, I served on the Social Justice Commission for the Canadian Catholic Bishops, and I went with Kairos on the, on the trip to Mexico, <coughs> primarily to look at the effect of free trade on the people of Mexico. But we went to a city, uh, Ciudad Juarez, which is uh, just across the Rio Grande River by, from uh, El Paso, Texas, which is a large American city, where the Mexican workers receive, in a day's wage, what the people in El Paso received in an hour. But what was announced in free trade? Business, but that was the injustice that was involved there. But what was going on, and they took us to a place where there had been over 300 women who had been murdered or disappeared in the past 10 years. And their bodies are just thrown in fields. And we went to a place where there was 13 crosses in this field where they had found the bodies of 
person has ever been accused or brought to trial for those murders. And I thought, well, that's Mexico. Canada's not like that. But what's happening now in this question of with uh, these disappearing women, primarily of Aboriginal women, it is happening here. It is happening here. And that's a huge uh, cause for us to see that how people can be seen to be used and discarded. <coughs> we have created, he says, a throwaway culture which is spread. A throwaway culture. Now, we're into that up to our minutes. The only mountain in this part of Saskatchewan is outside of Regina. It's the dump. I don't know how many feet high the dump is in the You can see it almost on the horizon of things we throw away. And every Sunday, the parking lot for Costco and, and the malls, full of people buying more stuff that they'll throw away and buy more stuff and throw away. And we get caught up in it. In fact, we, uh, we allow ourselves, and this also is a particular people, and I should use quotations of this too. We allow ourselves to be identified as consumers, as a word which defines who and what we are. Okay. If I call to consumers, that would be called, right? Is that what we are? Beings that consume. No, we're not. Okay. We shouldn't let people call. And that's why in this throwaway culture, it's easy for us to throw away people. You uh, see that the way our society deals with the beginning of life issues and the end of life issues is by throwing away people. Okay, throwing away people. And he says it's no longer simply about exploitation and oppression. It's about something new. It's about exclusion. And exclusion ultimately has to do with what it means to be a part of the society in which we live. Those excluded are no longer society's underside, or its fringes, or its disenfranchised. They're no longer even a part of society. No longer being a part of our society. They are simply disregarded. Says the excluded are not the exploited, but the outcasts. They're the leftovers that we throw away. And we allow that to, you know, the many, our own city of Regina, we did it this our, we did social problems and, and gangs where uh, young people kill each other. You know. uh, I'm not saying that we ignore that, but it just goes on and on and on and on without having fundamental causes of that being exam. We let people be thrown away. But he also talks there about the trickle-down effect in the economy, which means that the top 1% can get 40% of the income from the country. Billions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. But the idea that then that causes some of the trickle-down is eventually Poor at the bottom to get some, because they get so much at the top. The trickle down effect. So he says, well, the excluded are still waiting for that trickle down to happen to them. He said, to sustain a lifestyle which excludes others, or to sustain enthusiasm for that selfish ideal of globalization.
current financial crisis can make us overlook the fact that it is originated in a profound human crisis, which is the denial of the primacy of the human person. It goes on to, I'm getting close to my end here, so we'll just uh, I'll even talk about this a lot. Uh, when, the, when the human person ceases to be the prey of the principal and main object of our financial economy, then um, all sorts of other things fall apart. He talks about that the ancient golden calf has returned with the idolatry of money. And he calls it the dictatorship of an impersonal economy which lacks a truly human person. And when he calls it a dictatorship, He's talking about the power that it has over our lives. We are governed by that economy. He says when we do that, people are reduced to simply one of, one of their needs alone, consumption. Reduce, that's lower what we exist for, to consume. How often do you hear in the, we're talking about the economy, the economy now, Getting healthy because people are spending more money. Words, people are consuming. There's a movement now called the anti what is it? Degrowth. Right? Degrowth. Degrowth. Degrowth, yes. Not growth, but we need to degrow. Degrowth. Not grow the economy, but diminish the economy. So that we can live healthier and happy lives. That's another topic. Yeah, but don't forget that. Something about like what Jesus said in order, you must give away all that you possess. Uh, the first power that's in this uh, as well. The third thing he talks about are financial systems that rule and do not serve. And he says that what's going on in these financial situations is rejection of ethics and the rejection of God. So we find that in our society and the countries of our economic society, ethics now are being poo-poo. They're seen as how counter or nothing because they our Christian ethics makes money and power relative and not passive. They make it relative
between 70 and 80 percent. That's people who are willingly left on the fringes. And the root of the problem is see if I put that in there and not deal with the exclusion and the inequality. Now, what is the violence in our own cities which arise from exclusion and inequality? And versus the answer. So, so, in all of this, we have a more hopeful vision of our world and of our Canadian society that we can bring to Our vision is to give witness to that vision by our own actions. And our greatest witness will be a church, a parish, which excludes no one and in which everyone is treated with justice.